this is Tony. This is Paul coming at you from the Friends for Life podcast. And we're a go. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Friends for Life podcast. Thanks for tuning back in. Today, our special guest is Nicole Corey. She's the founder of Acoustics for Autism and Project I Am, which is the nonprofit that goes along with Acoustics for Autism. And she's also a Toledo Municipal Court judge and most importantly, rock and roller. So let's dive right into this awesome episode. But we are definitely excited to chat about acoustics for autism. And, you know, that's been going on for a long time. And, you know, just kind of the momentum it's built crazy. You see the signs all over mommy and all that stuff all the time. Sure. And it's, it seems like such a cool event. And, you know, us being in the disability field, we're really excited to kind of join sure. forces with all these awesome people. So uh, before we get too crazy with questions and answers and all this fun stuff, Nicole, why don't you tell us a little bit of a background about yourself, how, you know, you got involved with Acoustics for Autism and started the whole thing up and running and from, sure. from a small organization to now this awesomely big annual right. event. Um, so I, yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm a Toledo native. I have I've been here my whole life. I, uh, I'm a Toledo public school grad, uh, went away for college, came back for law school and then started working as a criminal defense attorney in, sorry, I've got super glue on my hands now, uh, <laughs> in, uh, 2002. So, um, I've always been a super, super involved person, uh, mm-hmm. whether it was in high school, whether it was in college, it's just, that's kind of my nature. Mm-hmm. And, um, I had, you know, I think people hear the word autism and they, they back then were thinking like rain, man, that's the best yeah, example yeah. <laughs> I can give, you know? So, but, but as things progressed and as time progressed, obviously, um, people, the diagnosis and the spectrum, which it truly is a spectrum mm-hmm. disease, got a mm-hmm. lot bigger. And so uh, I'm also a musician. I've been a musician for, you know, since I was in the womb. So my whole family is very musically talented. And awesome. uh, in about 2006, 2007-ish, my, uh, a friend of mine's child was diagnosed with uh, within the autism spectrum. Mm-hmm. And it was very new to everybody. And one of the things that really bothered me as I was learning about it a little bit more was, you know, there was no, there was no money. There was no, um, there wasn't anything available for people to use for their out-of-pocket expenses. So yeah, mm-hmm. it's great that there's all these fundraisers, but the fundraisers are going to support the actual providers of the services, Mm -hmm. um, you know, so that they can make the programs better, which is fantastic. But what good is that going to do if a family can't pay for it? Because what I found was, you know, while my friend happened to be lucky enough to, to not worry that much about money, they still opened a credit card up and, um, you know, it was specifically for autism stuff. And at one point it was up over $200,000 wow. and that's not an exaggeration. And this is, this is a, a hardworking family who does well, father's a doctor, um, you know, and, and they were having that problem, but what I saw was here's a family who um, they were not going to stop at anything to get their child, what they thought would be best for their child and what might help their child. And they found a program um, that was really, really doing wonders, like wonders and early diagnosis of course was always key. So as I learned this, you know, they started doing fundraising, they started, uh, and I'm not the type to mention other people's fundraisers, uh, but you know, they, they were doing some pretty big fundraisers that ended up being um, nationally uh, tied. So, mm-hmm. you know, you sit there and you say, OK, I'm donating this money to this family because of this. But they don't see any of it. Mm-hmm. They don't see I mean, not, none of it. So not only is it most of it not staying locally, but it's also not even helping the people that need to come up with the money to pay for this stuff. So I was bothered by that. And, um, you know, one, I, you know, doing things in the Nicole way of doing things, I just kind of said, you know, let's, let's do something. Let's have a fundraiser. Um, I have a very strong connection to the village idiot, uh, in mommy and yeah. you know, owners are my best friends, known them for a million years. And they were always good about doing things at their bar, not to mention it's kind of the Mecca for music in our area. Oh, yeah. And when I say our area, I mean, I don't just mean Toledo. I mean, I, mm-hmm. I, I think it's a regionally wide known 
venue mm-hmm. at this point for, for music, musical acts. So I said, hey, can I take over your bar for the day? I'm not asking you for anything else. Just let me take over your bar for the day. Sure. You know, and we, if there's anything that anybody knows about the, the music community in Northwest Ohio, it is, aside from the fact that I honestly would pit it up against anybody in the world in terms of talent, uh, generosity is huge. And mm-hmm. I, I sometimes feel badly because, you know, musicians get hit up constantly. Um, they're the first people anybody to go to, Hey, I want to have a fundraiser. I need to have music, you know, and they're donating their time. And I think that to the lay person, people don't understand, you know, it's not just about standing up there and playing a guitar and singing songs, <laughs> you know, you have sound equipment, <laughs> you know, it's like you, you have, you have sound equipment, you, you, it takes time to get there. It takes time to set up. It takes time to sound check yep. it. To, I mean, your two hour gig to you is like a four hour gig to a musician. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so we, you know, I, I joined together with some friends and I said, you know, I'm going to develop this charity and uh project. I am the name uh, came from, um, so, th- so when a friend of mine did a, f- a fundraiser, it was one of those walks, uh, mm-hmm. they made up t-shirts and they had a slogan and it was, it's become our slogan, which was, I laugh, I cry, I love, I play, I am. Mm-hmm. And so I said, let's call this thing project. I am, and let's have that be our slogan. Um, so I, you know, just sent in the paperwork to the secretary of the state, formed the nonprofit, didn't think much of it. Then we had this fundraiser this day. We had, it was like, 17 acts on one day at the village idiot from noon until two o'clock in the morning. And we raised like $10,000 and it was awesome. Nice. But I think, but then what, what we did was we, um, we joined with a couple programs. This is the only time we ever did. And the reason we did was because they had offered to let us use like their be under the umbrella of their 501 C three for that first fundraiser. Um, if somebody decided that they wanted their donation to get a receipt. Okay. So we had three different places that none of them are in existence anymore, which is sad. So they're hearing in speech center, uh, the Collingwood center aquatics program, and then the hope program up at Beaumont hospital in Detroit. They all said, yes, if somebody specifically says, I want a tax write off, they can write, they could pick one of those three places, they would write the check, and then they promised that we could decide which family was going to benefit from the money at those programs. Other than that, all the money we raised was going to be specifically decided by us. So, you know, if we raised $3,000 toward Toledo Hearing and Speech Center, then we had uh, applicants from Toledo Hearing and Speech Center write to us to say why they wanted you know, why they were deserving of that scholarship, we'll call it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so everybody liked it so much that we just formed the, I got my own 501c3 paperwork. (laughs) By the next year, we were already figuring out how to make it bigger. By the year after that, it was even bigger. 14 years in, you know, we've outgrown mommy, but I refuse to move it. And luckily the city doesn't want us to move it. So they're really, Mm -hmm. really willing to make us, stay and to do whatever we need to do. Um, but I mean, I've always said, you know, it's home is the village idiot and that's where it will always be. I just got to figure out how to keep, you know, making, making that <laughs> larger. So yeah. So that first year we went from one stage and, you know, by year, um, let's, let's skip year 14 because of COVID I had to do things a lot differently, <laughs> yes. but year 13, yeah. you know, year 13, we were at, um, seven stages and 15,000 people. Jeez. Um, and that's on a cold Sunday in March. And, yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> then people say, well, why don't you move it to the summer? Well, uh, let me ask you a question. Do you know of any other event the first Sunday in March? No, I have zero competition. Mm, um, it's about smart, yeah. midway through the time people are kind of getting stir crazy. You know, the last big outdoor event was probably in September, usually the Greek festival or something like that. Mm, some kind of mm. Oktoberfest thing. You're three months after Christmas. So you're not just hitting people up around the holiday. Mm. It's like the perfect time. Autism awareness month. Yes, I understand is in April, but again, mm. this is when our event is. And, I tell you, we have had every um, type of uh, natural disaster you could imagine from a tornado, (laughs) you know, we had a blizzard our first year, we had a tornado our second year, 
We've had it be 70 degrees. We've had it be 19 degrees. And no matter what, (laughs) people do not care. They come out. And if you talk to our beer company, which is True House, they do the Mm. Budweiser products. We sell more beer in one day on a Sunday than they sell throughout the entire year in a one in a one day yep. Sunday event. So yep. people are ready to go and and why why change a formula that's worked for, you know, 14 years. So um so after we officially after we formed the 501c3, you know, we developed the scholarship process and 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 my whole thing is, you know, you if you meet one child with autism, you meet one child with autism because every child is so different. And right. the treatments that work for some don't work for others. Some may never work for anybody. Sometimes it's something as silly as needing a specialty item or, you know, sensory, sensory friendly goods, those kinds of things. Yeah. Um, for us, we are purely a, a fundraising resource and a scholarship pool for families. It is not my job to tell you where your child has to go. It is not my job to tell you what kind of treatment or therapy or goods your child should have. So if, mm-hmm. if you ever go to our website and look at our actual scholarship application, you know, what are you requesting? Are you request, you know, why? And then they have to provide a lot of background documentation. It's not just, oh, I want this money. They obviously have to provide the assessment. The child has to be on the autism spectrum. Mm-hmm. They have to have an assessment from whatever they're, you know, uh, requesting. I've had families that say, no, no, this kid, he's going to be fine in in the summer camp. And I'm like, okay, but I need the summer camp to say that. Oh, it's fine. It's fine. Okay. You said, and then day one, oh, well, he can't go. He's not a good fit. And now, and then they won't return the money. And it's like, (laughs) this is what I was trying to prevent. So we make the, the providers have to give an assessment um, to say, yes, this is a good fit for this child. Yes. There's got to be documentation. And then, you know, we base, a lot on um, volunteering to our organization, which mm-hmm. is not a prerequisite, but it certainly helps when it comes to the amount of funding that you may get. Um, and we also, it doesn't matter if you make $300,000 a year, if you make $3,000 a year, we, we don't look at that. We treat everybody the same. What we give you is not based on your economic basis at all. It's purely based on, how do you affect us when you send us that scholarship? How does that that letter that you write to us to explain your story? How is how is it helping your kid? How is your family situation affected or not affected if you get this money? You know, um, you see a lot of things change, and and I think this is society as a whole. Mm. People are not quite as. Um, some people are not quite as grateful as they used to be. Some people are a little bit more entitled than they than others you said are. That's so politically correct. Uh, I, there's man. so many other words we want to use. <laughs> I got to get reelected every six years. So there you um, go. <laughs> yeah, we've so, said that many times, but yes. So yeah, so one of those things is, um, you know, I used to have the only if we get a scholarship, the only thing we ask parents to do is to write. We name our scholarships after people who have contributed in some way, and that does not mean money, yeah. to the organization. Um, our volunteers, you know, we can't be who we are because we're 100% volunteer based without this pool of people. So you have, mm-hmm. you know, Joe Schmo, who's at every event picking up trash and doing these things. Well, it's because of him that I don't have to go hire a trash company to come and do yeah. that, which saves us money, which then means that I can give that money to little Susie. You know, mm-hmm. we asked them to write a letter of thanks to the person that we, you know, named in the scholarship, you know, and, and you get some people that they go out and they, I mean, you know, they, they get paintings drawn by their kid and here's their picture and they send them constant updates. And you get some people that I have to like, you know, twist their arm to send an email saying thank you. Mm-hmm. And, and a lot of, of, of people don't even read the letter. So it's like, thank you for funding the scholarship. It's like, that isn't why we named it after yeah, Joe yeah. Schmo. You know, yeah, did you not read it? So that kind of stuff gets really <laughs> frustrating. And the bigger we are and the more successful we are and the more money we have, the more money we want to give out. But in the same respect, you know, I want to give it to people who appreciate who we are and what we do because nobody else does what we do, you Mm -hmm. know? Yeah. Um, So that's, you know, that's the, the long and short of uh, what, what we are, how we started, how we're doing now. And, um, 
you know, I, it's a, it's, it's a force to be reckoned with. Um, I was hell bent on making sure this event happened live and in person this year. And it did, uh, Mm -hmm. certainly not the way we wanted it to be, but, um, next year's just going to be insane. So long as, you know, the country is open, which, you know, hopefully fingers crossed after June 2nd, everything will stay that way. It's going to be absolutely, I mean, we start planning, while we are working the the event for next year's event, you know, we're always, my mind is always keeping notes and keeping track of, you know, uh, what did we do right? What did we do wrong? What could be different next year? I have to remember to move this here. I have to put that there. And it all kind of goes into this craziness that is my mind. And then yeah. it gets organized at some point. So this is so, so funny because we were just having this conversation about how our brains work and it's, yeah. you know, we're constantly, it, it doesn't matter what we're doing. We're looking at ways that we can grow and expand and continue to teach, show and educate. I tell yeah. my husband all the time, cause my husband is, is very ADD, uh, but he's very disorganized ADD. I always say I'm, pro- I'm Same. productively yeah. insane. Like it, I, I can think you know, for some reason, the way my brain works, I can hear 10 conversations at once. I can compartmentalize them all. I understand. I can hear everything everybody's doing and I'm on top of it. I get that everybody doesn't work that way. Um, but yes, that is, that's, you know, to run an organization like this, that again, is volunteer based and is, you know, we used to do a lot of events. I mean, all the time we were doing events and then it just got to the point where you're like, man, you know, you're really burning out people. You're, you're doing mm-hmm. St. Patrick's day. You're doing opening day. You're doing 4th of July. You're doing the rib offs. You're doing. And it was like, man, every month you're asking for a hundred volunteers. That's a lot to ask. <laughs> yeah. people. Uh-huh. Yeah. You know? So we were like, you know, we make enough money off of acoustics for autism at this point that, that we're good. And we have, you know, tons of money to give out to these families. Um, you know, I just urge people to actually care about, you know, what they're writing, because this is a group of just volunteers that are taking time away from their 40 plus hour a week jobs to do this stuff and to do it because yes, it makes them feel good, but also because it's, you know, it's, it's become this beloved, uh, event and charity of the city. And, um, you know, the minute that we get tired because we're tired of, you know, people not really appreciating it, it'll be done. And and I don't want it to be done, you know? So luckily we've got some real strong families that have been with us for years that, Mm -hmm. you know, they know, man, you just, you, you apply whenever you want, you're going to get, you know, you're going to get whatever you want from us always. And don't take advantage of us and just are always there. You know, it's the one and dones that, that get a little bit like, Hey, well, we gave you all this money and we haven't even heard from you. So, you know, those kinds (laughs) of things that leave a bad taste in your mouth. Luckily those are few and far between. So, well, and you know, it's, it's really great from an outside perspective for acoustics for autism. I would say hands down as far as like, like uh, public persona and public attention around disabilities and autism. I would say you guys are, basically doing the best I've ever seen because, you know, someone like me, I used to work at a nonprofit and, uh, you know, as a program coordinator. So I understand the struggle of volunteers. Like I would, I would argue that getting volunteers is way harder than getting money half the time because, you know, people, I agree. (laughs) Yeah. People will give out money because it's a, it's like you said, a one and done thing. It's like, a, it's a easy to do, but getting people to take hours and hours to help is a lot. And uh, you guys are just killing it. It's yeah, amazing. Well, and don't for, don't forget, everybody just wants to work the beer tent. Well, <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, come on, uh, yeah. we, we can't all work the beer tent and you know, it, you got to earn your keep. You're not going to work your way up to the beer tent until you've earned your keep by picking up the trash for a couple of years, you know, yeah, that's a 10 year so, end deal. Yeah, yeah exactly. So it's, <laughs> it's definitely, it's definitely one of those. And you know what? I'll be honest with you. I would, and I don't even think that I'm pulling a, a, a bogus statistic out of nowhere. I would say 85% of our volunteers have absolutely nothing to do with autism at all. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That it's yep. just like people that either, uh, you know, no started off knowing me and then it was a friend of a friend who volunteered with the friend and then they came back and then they brought a friend and then they came back and you know so we've kind of as much as it's like I said it's very volunteer based but it, it's it's become its own little um I mean of course it's a corporation but it's become like its own little 
factory. You know, we have the same girl that's always does our merchandise. We have the same guy that always runs the bar. We have the same guy that always does all the bar backing. We have the same people that do the raffles, the same people that do the kids area. So it's kind of like they're our own little managers in each of these locations. And then we get, you know, volunteers that consistently work the silent auction every year. So they have their system. They know how it works. They know what goes on, which is great because, you know, six years ago, I was, it was me. And mm-hmm. yes, hundred percent. I'm a control freak. No doubt about it. Yeah. But <laughs> I, but I, in the same I've heard respect, that about myself, <laughs> you know, I'm a control freak and I'm going to delegate responsibility, but you're doing it wrong. You know, yeah. so <laughs> there you go. we, but luckily we've gotten a team together now where people are in charge of so many different facets of this thing mm-hmm. that, um, that we are, I don't have to do that anymore. I just kind of walk in circles for 15 hours. Um, you know, I, I, I jump on stage to play my set and I, I'm running around all making sure everything's okay. I'll jump in here and there, but I don't have to be stationary in one place anymore and, uh, and, and monitor what the heck's going on. So, Wait, so you, you run the event you set up the whole thing and you play during the event. That's yeah, yeah, impressive. Yeah, yeah. Cause I was going to say, I saw some pictures of you on stage and I was like, okay, was she just emceeing or yeah. <laughs> like, but it looks like you were actually uh, performing. Oh no. Yeah. I mean, we, uh, yeah. Uh, every, every year we're always the, you know, the six o'clock slot out in the tent. Um, okay which is always the best slot. Of course, I'm going to give myself the best slot. It's my event. Yeah. Um, yeah. Your show, your <laughs> rules. Yeah, it's, it's a blast <laughs> and it's great. And everybody always has a great time. And so, um, so yeah, it, it, it's hard. It is hard because I don't sleep for the whole week before I don't sleep the night before I don't even sleep the night of it's usually the day yeah. after that I'll, I will crash. Um, you know, you get done finally counting money and doing everything, getting to the bank. And then you're like sitting there at seven o'clock and you're like, oh my God, it's time to go to bed. Uh, yeah, that is hard to do because you got to remember too, it's usually 20 degrees outside. So not only are you running on no sleep and you're, you're, you're trying to get all this energy and you're, but you're running around outside in 20 degree weather. And then you got to get up on stage and sing. It's, it's, it's hard, but I'm like, come on, it's 45 minutes. You can, you can push yourself through. And then by the time I'm done singing is usually when I'm like, okay, I can kind of take a breath and everything should be cool at this point. So, well, uh, that's interesting. I, I mean, I'm a musician myself. I love, I love playing. What's, uh, Musical influences while we're there. Let's get off the disability topic for a minute. Sure. Let's see. What's who's some of your favorites that you really look up to? Uh, one million percent Led Zeppelin. Oh, yeah. uh, I Who worship uh, <laughs> Ann Will. I, I worship Ann Wilson's heart, a uh, voice from heart. She is my yeah. favorite voice. Um, if I could bring back anybody uh, dead, it would be Jimi Hendrix because he speaks to my soul. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I, but then I have some some random things like I love me some late eighties, early nineties, you know, hard rock, heavy metal. I am very good friends, and I was the attorney for the band Skid Row for twenty years. Oh, wow. um, I, I we don't want to know those stories, or maybe we do. That could be <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's they another podcast. Played. They have played for us um, oh. on two occasions before for events, so that was good. That's awesome. Um, I. I'm a very big fan and, and, and a a friend of of the band Tesla, who I love his voice. You can see the trend with all the raspy (laughs) rocker voices. Um, but then I also am a very good friend of, um, Rusted Root, one of my favorite bands ever. And they're the, they're so eclectic and they're so different and they're, you know what I mean? Um, so those are a lot of the influences. I mean, my first influence would have been would have been Mozart. I was four years old when I started playing the piano. So oh my God. that's wow. what I loved playing and what I grew up, you know, doing. Um, and then I sang in choir, but my, I have, I'm the oldest of four girls. My second sister was the singer and um, she would go all over the state, uh, Michigan, wherever uh, to to sing national anthem at a uh, sporting event, like bit like the lions and the, the calves and the pistons, mm-hmm. those kinds of things. That's awesome. So I was kind of always the piano player and she was always kind of the singer until people realized that I had a voice too. And it was like one of those things where, you know, bartending what one night at, you know, the original, original, real good Jed's barbecue and brew oh, um, wow. in 19, like 96 uh, back, back then. Uh, when I was, you know, uh, John Borelli 
and Bobby May, who are still playing to this day, would come and play. And I jumped up and sang Bobby McGee. And everybody was like, wow, you have a voice. And then I started playing acoustically. And then um, when I was 30, I said, well, if I can play the piano, I sure as hell should be able to pick up the guitar. So I, started, yeah. <laughs> I learned how to play the guitar. And then the acoustic thing turned into the full band. And um, and the full band's been live and strong for uh a little over 10 years. Nice. It's got to yeah. be a little bit of a relief to get up on stage because, you know, I've planning those big events like that. I've, I've been through that gauntlet a few times and it's just stressful. Like you said, you don't sleep. You're yeah. freaking out about stuff that's probably not going to happen. And, and you're, yeah. but to get up on stage and to just, and start playing, like it all kind of fades away for a, probably a good 45 minutes or something. You get to just be yeah. in your element and just perform. I am definitely in my element when I'm in front of a huge crowd. We've, we've been fortunate enough to open up for a lot of national acts. Um, so that's mm-hmm. really good. My favorite, I have two favorite moments. And and one would be when we brought Joan Jett to town and we opened oh, up for Joan Jett. So that was awesome. very, very cool, especially considering, you know, she's a female rocker with an all guy band. I'm a female rocker with an all girl band. So that was great. Uh, all guy band. But my favorite probably moment in all of my musical career ever was, you know, I had all these years and years and years, like I said, of um, uh, hanging around with the band Skid Row. And, you know, if you've ever seen Almost Famous, I was, you know, a Band-Aid. I wasn't a groupie. (laughs) I was a Band-Aid. And we were just, it's like a brother and sister relationship for for many, many years. And in Uh 2015, uh, we worked with Bar 145 and we Mm -hmm. had a concert in their parking lot where Skid Row was a headliner. And because of the noise ordinances, uh, they had to be done at 10 o'clock. So instead of opening for Skid Row, they actually opened for me. So um, (laughs) (laughs) I love it. So they they played outside, got done at 10 o'clock. And then the indoors regular bar night was was us. So my favorite moment ever was, um, you know, all these years and years and years. And I mean, even though these guys are like your best friends, you you still want them to like, they never had, I mean, they'd seen me play, but never, you know, you want them to think that you're good. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, And three of them, the drummer uh, and then the bass player and guitar player got up and played highway to hell with me. (laughs) And that was a moment. Even my, my husband said, he's like, man, he's like, you, he's like, I've never seen your face like that. Like you were almost (laughs) like, like you were finally like, like, this is the like, wow, man, like that was the moment for me that it was it was really, really, really cool. It was a really yeah. cool moment that I've been waiting that, for for 20 years, you know, and I and I got it. So. So, I, yeah, but the big know, crowds, man, it, it, I, I'm, I'm at awe here because I grew up my family, all of them, uh, they're in the R&B. Uh, um, singing and I, I'm talking like they sung with Anita Baker with uh, sure. um, anybody big from the 60s and 70s like all my uncles I have uh, we're, we're going to show some some photos <laughs> of some of the their cool looks and you know their interesting um, ways but all of that skipped me I can't yeah sing. I was going to say <laughs> yeah. what you didn't get that Gene man I can't <laughs> sing um I have I have a good ear for music. Like I love yeah. many genres of music, and I um, I can beatbox pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> That's something but, I want to learn how to do for the record. <laughs> look, see, well, we can sit there. You could probably teach me. There. But there you out go. of all the all out of all the instruments you play, what do you consider your favorite, and or your, your or what is it that you think that you're known for the best? What am I known for? I think I'm known for my voice for your voice in terms okay. of musically i think i'm known for gotcha. my voice and I, I think i'm known for being the girl in town who has the rock uh like that raspy mm-hmm. rock voice that can, i sing led zeppelin better than i sing aretha franklin now my sister sings aretha franklin better than she sings led zeppelin so <laughs> yeah. you know it, it is it's a it's a whole different game but i i mm-hmm. definitely know my limits you know one i'm going to tell you two songs i absolutely hate to sing happy birthday <laughs> and the national anthem is yeah. wow. and i think with me with the national anthem to me it is, it is a sacred thing and i don't feel that i do it justice now i can i sing it sure hmm. but again i grew up with my sister doing it my sister does do a fr- phenomenal national anthem so i don't know if with me i mean i if you if you haven't told i've got a bit of a perfectionist attitude about myself like i'm always striving go. for that <laughs> yeah and maybe it's because I don't feel that I 
can do it as well as other people. So I just don't, you know, it's the same thing with writing music. Mm -hmm. I would give anything to be a one hit wonder, but (laughs) I, I don't believe that I, everything that I start to write, I just throw away. I don't know if it's good or bad. And I know everybody else like, Oh, you can just write, 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 write. I can write, I can write all day long, but to me, it's not, it's not good enough to let anybody hear it. So I just kind of, that's, that's definitely a fault of mine. I just kind of throw it by the wayside, you know? Um, but, but yeah, no, my whole family, I mean, on both sides of my family, my mother's side, everybody played the piano. Everybody was in choirs and show choirs, that kind of thing. My father, everybody was in the choirs and the show choirs. My dad played the guitar. I'm very, very mad at him that he, <laughs> I started on the piano when I was four. It's like, why didn't you let me, you know, why, why wasn't I doing the piano and the guitar? The guitar I, right. I mean, I, it shouldn't take me until I'm 30 to pick it up and do it, but it did. <laughs> you know, I could have been a real badass, but I, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a you, very, you to... <laughs> I, I'm a very good rhythm, you know, background, a good guitar like that. I, I don't play solos. I, I know my limits. I probably could be if I had time to sit down and practice every day, but I don't. Um, so an yeah. answer, you know, but people definitely, I think, know me for my voice and for that just hard rocker edge, you know, attitude and songs. We do songs that nobody else really does, you know, I mean, yeah. which is good. I mean, that my whole goal is to not sound like everybody else. And, and I don't mm-hmm. think anybody can say that we sound like everybody else. So that's, so that's, that's always the goal as a yeah. musician. Yeah. yeah. And if it makes you feel any better, I've spent my entire <laughs> life since I was like 10 learning to try and play shred guitar. And yeah. then now I've been relegated to bass player in my new band. Oh, so if, you, no. <laughs> if it makes you feel better, and you haven't dropped that far. I, I so. used to play the cello. <laughs> I think there I, you go. I, you I, like, I, I, I remember. The making. And I think we started off playing some Mozart, <laughs> you know, to learn how. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll be honest with you. When I sit down to the key, I, I randomly sat down the other day. I have a piano in my basement. I just, I, I don't ever sit and play it. Um, I mean, I, I was very good, I would say in college years. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but I, I just haven't, I mean, I sat down and tried to play a Beethoven song the other day and I was like, eh, I, I mean, I, I can do it, but it's not the way it used to be at all. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, I certainly um, wouldn't pick up where I left off, like with the hardest rock Rachmaninoff song I ever played. I, there'd be no <laughs> way I could even read it, let alone, let alone try to play it right now. But, um, so, I mean, the guitar is great because, I've, I've learned, you know, there's a lot of things that you can do with it. And you know what, you can go out with a guitar and you can sit and, and play an acoustic gig. You can't really do that with just, you know, your piano. I mean, yeah. you, you can, gonna, but I'm not going to go You're going to bring a baby grand to the, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to, right? to places with so, you. So, yeah, I, my, my husband keeps saying, we, we need to get you a guitar so that, you know, <laughs> the, the songs that you... <laughs> Let's go back do some, there. Do some Devo or something like that. There you so. go. Uh, yeah. I like the direction that that's headed. I, I do Absolutely. as well. Um, with, uh, so with the uh, COVID stuff that happened this year, obviously, thankfully, it's it seems to be kind of wrapping up here. Uh, with with whole, the whole, everybody basically had to learn how to live stream overnight. Was that, a, yeah. was that a nightmare or how did that go pretty smooth? Because, I mean, by the time you guys were putting the event on, I mean, yeah. it, you've had time to, to kind of no, figure it out well, maybe. Well, but, Okay, in terms of live streaming for the specifics of the event, BCAN did that. Mm. Um, they partnered with us and they agreed to do all three stages all day, which was phenomenal. And that nice, was something nice. that I, I was I was thinking they were going to come and live stream for like uh, an, you know a couple hours on one of the stages. They did all three mm-hmm. stages, That's great. Um, and hopefully in the future they're going to continue to do that. We just I know they did uh, the Village Idiot in 19 um but because we were talking about the tent we're like well how, where do we push it how do we figure this out so yeah, now yeah. that they know kind of the setup that'll be good um in terms of like actually playing gigs uh live streams were worse than going and playing a gig it was awful because not and again you have lay people which i appreciate you're trying to do what you can for your event but you have to listen to the musicians here now mm-hmm. don't get me wrong some musicians, if they are, oh yeah, sure, I'll do it. But that is fantastic, and that is great. But I'm, if I'm going to charge you, you know, to put on this product, it needs to be professional. It needs to be professional. Oh my god, with a full band, you know how hard that is to do. Yeah. The acoustic stuff Actually, is a little I bit do. easier. <laughs> yeah, the acoustic stuff is a little bit easier. But like again, you know, I did one. Um, I did one for the law school, and it took us four hours 
to get 45 minutes of usable music for this. And that was before we even had to edit the the actual Mm -hmm. video and stuff. And I thought this is not worth it. You know, I tried to convince a couple of the events that, that we got canceled that just wanted to do these live streams. I was like, you know, I'm not trying to be rude, but people aren't sitting and watching the live streams. They're just not. It's not the they're, same they're, experience. Yeah. They'll send you the check. They'll, they'll do the text to do whatever, but they're not going to sit there for four hours and watch a band play on their TV. I just don't believe yeah. that they're going to do that. If I'm wrong, yeah. then I'll, I'll donate the money myself, but I just don't believe they're going to do that. So we, you know, we tried to convince a couple like, Hey, why not have a VIP area? You know, they're allowing 10 people at a table. Why not do the small things and then just have a partially live? Pro- no, no, no. Nobody wanted to do that. Well, I said, well, that's what I ended up doing for acoustic autism and it worked. Um, yeah. there you go. so we had, it was awful and I never want to have to do anything like this again, because <laughs> I I'd, rather, I'd rather deal with 15,000 drunk people than 300 any day. <laughs> um, but we had all of the tables. So we were lucky because the Elks is actually a hall. So yeah, okay. you can seat 300 people pursuant to COVID at the Elks. So that was great. So we had the village idiot tables set up exactly how they were operating. We had the Buster Brown set up exactly how they were operating and the elk set up exactly as they were operating with the most capacity they could. Mm -hmm. And we did four time slots that staggered and you basically got like a ticket for a two hour reservation. Now acoustics for autism has always been, and it will always be free. So imagine having a ticketed event that's free. That's hard too. So yeah, so it's free and people are offering to buy it. And I'm like, but then, but then that makes it be about who can afford to come. And that's not what this event's about. It's about mm-hmm. everybody feeling like they can go to a charity event because think about it. All these charity events that you see are, you know, hundred dollars a head, $150 a head, $200 a head. None of them are, are like free to where everybody feels. And just because you don't make enough money to donate a hundred dollars to be an event doesn't mean you don't want to be part of an event. And why yeah. is your $5 any less important than the hundred dollars that this guy can give? Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, I, there is no way I was going to make it about money. So what we did was we took um, all of our old faithful, like and when I say faithful, I mean, you know, the sponsors who have been there for 10 years, the, yeah. the, the volunteers, the musicians, all of the people who make acoustics for autism, what it was, were literally given tickets for a specific time slot at a table. And that was like planning the wedding from hell, if you can imagine. (laughs) I mean, you're trying to organize 1,500 people. And it's like, okay, you know, you want to put the musicians together. Oh, but I can't put him with him because he used to date his girlfriend. Oh, I can't do that because (laughs) they broke up and they don't talk anymore. And it was bad. It would have been great if it would have just been a first come, first serve. But I couldn't do that because of COVID. So we we gave out tickets. We had people confirm their tickets and say that they wanted them. And then anything left over, we took up to Buster Brown's and we said, first come, first serve, come and get them. Mm-hmm. And it worked out very, very well. The thing, the only negative to that, other than it being a pain in the butt for us, was a lot of the people that accepted the tickets that didn't use them. Mm-hmm. So again, we yeah. couldn't you know, cause you're sitting there saying, okay, well, it's been a half hour. These people aren't here. Here's Johnny, Johnny Smith out here. He really wants to come in. He doesn't have a ticket. Do we let him in and let him sit mm-hmm. at this seat? Mm-hmm. By the end of the night, we were doing that, but you also can't encourage, <coughs> excuse me, people to come out and wait and see, because now you're encouraging crowds outside to wait in line and see what happens. We didn't want to have to deal with that. That would yep. be publicly, that would have been a nightmare for us. Yes, absolutely. We did. Sounds like, it almost sounds like getting uh, the, the the vaccine. <laughs> That's exactly. <laughs> yeah. You know what? You're right. You're right. We, <laughs> You're um, not wrong. We did contact tracing on the back of every ticket stub. We had everybody write their phone number and their name. Mm-hmm. So we had nice. their time slot. We had their table. I've still got it saved. Health department wants to call me. Okay, mm-hmm. here's here's what we got. I haven't had one call. I haven't had one complaint. I mean, the biggest complaint were by people saying, you know, that they wanted to stay longer or why do I have to be in Buster Brown's at seven? Why can't I be in the village? Well, because you can't be, I don't know what to tell you. That's the tickets that's left. You know, (laughs) know, I I don't know what else to say. So, um, (laughs) but hopefully we'll never have to do that again. You know? Yes. Hopefully. Yeah. And we still did, to be honest, we made, we made about 75, 5% of what we usually make. And that was with a 10th of the crowd and no beer sales. Wow. And our beer sales. No beer sales. 
No, because we could we we were yep. in the venues. So yeah. our beer money all comes from the outdoor sales. We didn't have any outdoor sales. So no beer sales and 10% of our crowd. What I found this year was that um, silent auction did a lot better. We had it online, oh, but okay. also in person. So no matter what, you had to bid online. But we had it up for an entire week. And we always have a buy it now option. And I probably got rid of 20 items before the event even happened on those buy it nows, wow. which was Good easy. Job. Um, but then it also opens it up, you know, Hey, I'm out of town day of acoustics, man, I can't go, oh, but I can bid on this, you know, autograph poster of Skid Row if I want it, you know, those kinds of things. We also made some of the raffles available online. Um, Are you going to continue that moving forward? I think uh, we will. The one thing we have to figure out is it was easy this year because, you know, the silent auction is in an area where this year it was in an area where they were kind of, um, they were confined to a, a, it was a room all to themselves. Well, normally they're out in a tent with 15,000 people. It's like, well, how do you, how do you force them to go online and register? You know, it, it's, it's, it's loud out there and it's, it's mm. not as easy. So the question will be, what do we want to do about the silent auction next year? Do we want to keep it inside up there and just tell everybody all the items are available upstairs, but everything's online or do we get more business by people walking by it in the tent? And, and if, if so, how do we make sure they know how to register? How to, you know, that kind of a thing. So I will, will most likely keep doing that exactly the same way. That's Just have to figure out HWIC, where. the head woman yeah. in charge. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. I'm, I'm always very, very uh, glad that people like you exist that can just come up with solutions to problems because yeah. <laughs> that kind of stuff it will freeze people in their tracks. Yeah. They'll be like, oh. Uh, I don't know what to do. And then it just, it, yeah. and like, you're just like, I don't know, figure it out. Let's get it. And I love that well, because we need more of that. that. I, yes. I hate that all the time. I tell people all the time at work, I'm like, I am so tired of everybody pointing the finger at whose fault it was. Let's mm. just, <sighs> let's just fix it. I don't yeah. care whose fault it was. Let's just fix it and just learn from it. That's it. That's it. all I want to do is fix it and learn from it. So mm -hmm. we're the know. same way. We're always yeah. talking about that. That's a, I mean, that's a good mindset to have with anything because the, I, I'm a big proponent of the more you talk about it, the less you're doing about it. Bye. Just yeah. do something, anything. And if that doesn't work, there's always other avenues. Mm -hmm. Like just and figure it out. Right the now. nice thing is we have, like I said, you know, we've got all these people that are kind of at this point have been with the charity for long enough that, 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 I won't say they know my mind and how that it works, but they, they feel confident enough that they, if they have to make a judgment call, they'll make it. And if it's the wrong one, they'll just deal with me later. You know what I mean? It's one of those things. And it's never going to be so bad that I'm like, oh, my God. But but, you know, it, it could be somewhere I'm like, no, 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 no. That's not how that was supposed to happen. This person was supposed yeah. to get this. And, they, uh, you know, but again, you know, when it's all in your head. And you're trying to write things down in instructions, but you know it's all in your head. You you forget. I I can't I can't write everything down that's in my head. I guess yep. is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, so exactly. that's why we've kind of developed this. And, and like I said, we've already had like three or four meetings since the, the event. Mm -hmm. This is how we want to do this next year. This is who we want in charge of this. And we've already talked to people, and we're already in our minds getting it getting it worked out and getting it figured out. So. Well, what you do is is super amazing, <laughs> and we are very glad that you're yes. bringing awareness because that's what why we started our podcast is to bring awareness to people with disabilities and, and help them find resources because it's not always easy. Like you said, wealthy families that do well are still having a hard time, and you know this isn't something you choose that when it with an with you have a child with a disability, it just happens. It's just like a, anything else, you know. Like, and it is a huge cost, and it can be a, a huge issue, which Tony knows very well. He's yes. he's worked in this field. <laughs> his whole life basically so you know we're very glad that you're bringing awareness and what you do uh and you know we don't want to keep you all day but we have one segment that is our favorite segment of the show before we wrap up here yes. and get your info for people we want to play a little game so tony <laughs> time for rapid fire <laughs> maybe i should just have you put in some real drums yeah i'll do that <laughs> you, your drum sound effects are okay they but are. we got a rock star here so we can we gotta have better know, drum right? sounds than that Look, yeah. i was going to say i used to let you know how i used to pay my oh. husband is the drummer of the band. I got about 14 uh -oh. drum really? kits in our house. So. <laughs> Look, I was going to say, I used to play drums at my church when I was younger, but saying that in front of two people who are true magi <laughs> uh, I say yeah. magicians, Don't, musicians, maybe. 
is kind of embarrassing. <laughs> so I used to um, you might keep hit that a couple one on, of snares. You might keep that one on the down. <laughs> yeah, keep it on there. Hey man, no, no, I've I've been I've been to churches with drum kits, and I'll tell you, we did. Uh, we went to a lot of the Baptist churches when I was uh, running for election. I got to be real good friends with a lot of those pastors. Those yeah. bands and those those bands and those. Uh, choirs which aren't really choirs are yeah unbelievably talented yeah. so Phenomenal. don't sell yourself short <laughs> well thank you i appreciate that <laughs> i'll sell them All short right. for you there, there that's my job over here <laughs> well rapid fire um what we do we ask you some questions you have to answer them as far sure. as you can i've kind of changed sure. the format it's more of a um would you rather so listen up and here we go no oh boy would you <clears throat> rather sing a song f- for a hundred people with a mouthful of peanut butter or play the piano with your toes. <laughs> and this is in front of a hundred people. I think the mouthful of peanut butter. <laughs> yeah. I Could think you the mouthful of peanut butter, yeah. Look, this I is really wrong do. of me. Because you're in your if, kitchen. You have any? I want to no. see it. <laughs> <laughs> that, would, that would be fun. Uh, we'll go. We'll keep going, though. All right. Would you rather try to stay awake for 36 hours straight um, with a sleep aid or drink coffee and try to get eight hours of sleep? Wait, stay away for 36 hours, but I have to take a sleep aid? Sleep aid, yes. So I got to fight the medication making exactly. me sleep? Exactly. <laughs> yep. Yep. I, I would or probably, try to go to sleep for eight would, hours. It would never work because I'll take a cat. I'll take a five minute cat nap and then I would be up for the 36 hours, but I would lose if I did that. So I'd yeah. have to go with the second one, but I don't drink coffee. So it was a terrible mm. question all the way around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I should have did more research. <laughs> what about black green tea or something? Okay. Would you rather clean windows on the tallest building in the world or clean all of New York subway restrooms? Oh, God. (laughs) (laughs) These questions keep getting weirder. Man, I'm like, I'm down a rabbit hole of just weird stuff in here. (laughs) That one is so hard because I'm, I don't like heights very much. I guess. Me neither. I'm petrified of them. Oh, God. How many windows would I have to clean? (sighs) The tallest building in the world, I believe, is Dubai, uh, isn't it? Yeah, Dubai. It's like a mile tall. But just, but like just the top row of windows? Oh, no, the, all of them. Oh, no, I'll clean the subways. There you go. Yeah, I'll clean the subway. I'll I agree. Clean subway I, I would do the same thing. Uh, yeah. You know, hazmat suit and go to town. <laughs> no, thank you. No. I love me Our- some bleach. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, that was an interesting rapid fire. Uh, bef- <laughs> before we wrap up here, Nicole, I want to thank you for uh, taking time out and coming and talk to us on the Friends for Life podcast. Where can people learn more about acoustics for autism? So next year we can get more involved and get you some more people and sponsors and beer and that's that awesome. <laughs> so um, the, the name of the charity, of course, is Project I Am. So you can either go to projectiam.com or acousticsforautism.com. They take you to the same page. Uh, the easiest thing to do always is to like Project I Am on Facebook. Uh, make sure that you choose the right one. There is another one that's been getting some attention lately that's uh, out of Chicago. That's uh, I have the, let's just say I have the name trademarked and we'll leave it at that. Um, <laughs> uh, but that all being said, yes, obviously it's the autism one, obviously it's the one that you see pictures of mm-hmm, uh, us mm-hmm. playing music on, on stage. So that is always the easiest way. You can always email us through the website or info, info at acousticsforautism.com. Um, you know, again, it, it is a, it is a very important event to the community. Uh, you're right. We have brought a lot of awareness to, to, to the event. But I think the other thing that we've really brought awareness to is, you know, the whole goal of the event is to make everybody with any disability, especially autistic kids, uh, feel quote unquote normal. And so, you know, you get a lot of, how dare you have an event where, you know, my child is supposed to be for autism and blah, blah, blah. Well, I I'll tell you what, I challenge you to bring your kid, but you gotta remember you're still the parent, you know, you're still the parent. You've got to make the decision. You know what? If your kid doesn't like loud, put some headphones on them. But there's yeah. something about this event that parents come up to me every year and every year and every year. And they say, my kid has never stood still for so long. My kid has never sat there and paid attention to the bands before. They've never danced before. They've never been, they've never done that. There's something about this event that gives a little bit of a gateway to families to experiment with these things, with the crowds, mm-hmm. with the whatever. We always have a kid's area and we always have a sensory friendly area if it's too much. 
you know, so I can't prevent uh, a guy from, you know, running into you and your child and, and dumping beer on you by accident. But you know what? That guy's beer paid for money that's going to help your kid help one day if you apply right. for a scholarship. So, uh, you know, don't be petrified of it. Talk to our parents are awesome. They've been around forever. Um, you know, it, it is definitely something, you know, come early, bring the headphones, bring the, bring the things that your kids need and experiment with it because you might be surprised at the reaction that you're going to get. And it might teach you something about your child that nobody would have ever known otherwise. So I, uh, I would encourage people to give it a shot. And um, if you are on the spectrum and, and you are looking for help with funding and you need it and you can write to us or you can go on the scholarship link and fill out an application. I mean, it, the, the worst that could happen is you say no, but mm -hmm. I'm you know here to tell you that we try to help as many people as we absolutely can. And absolutely. once you are part of the organization, you will learn to love it as if it is your, your family. So. That's good. Yes. Beautiful. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Nicole, for all that you do. And yes. we really are excited for everything that you guys have coming up mm -hmm. this year. Well, you've you've already had the event and next year. And you know, we're love we're loving the progress and the growth and the rock and roll. So yeah. keep up the good work. And last thing, if I can get a spot. <laughs> I have a wonderful rendition of Mary Had a Little Lamb <laughs> that I can play on the piano. I think that um, I'll, I'll make some Maybe people you happy. could be in between the big bands at the tent next year or something like there that. <laughs> I'll, I'll do it. You, Stand on the bar with do the me a, Do me a favor and send me your address and your t-shirt sizes. I'm getting ready to put all the leftover merchandise back in the trailer. So I will, if I have your sizes, I will send you guys some shirts Perfect. from this year. Yeah, Thank you, Nicole. It. We'll Thank do you. that right, right. now. Have a good All right. one. Thanks, guys. Yep. Be great. Bye. Bye. Hey, everybody. Thanks for watching this episode of the Friends for Life podcast here on YouTube. If you can't help us out, go down below, hit that subscribe button. Also, if you're looking for a job, Friends for Life is hiring DSPs right now. So if you would like to apply, head over to friendsforliferc.com. Hit up our employment page, fill out the form, and we'll get back with you. And we want to take a minute here to thank Nicole for coming on and sharing her love and passion for music and acoustics for autism. Such an awesome event. Can't wait for it to come up next year. And hopefully everything's wide open again and everybody can rock out, have some beer and support a great cause. So thank you, Nicole. And as always, we'll see you guys next week. <laughs>